You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Sinister podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their inventory of classic vehicles and follow them on Instagram at Commonwealth underscore classics. Thank you, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 100 for July 2021. This is the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me via Zoom is Harold. Hey. And in the studio, special just for the 100th is Morgan. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you. It's good to be here. You actually sound clear and whatnot. (laughs) There's not a few hundred miles between us. Morgan came down for the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. We'll talk more about that in a few moments. So he's in the studio and able to join us coincidentally for the 100th. Dixon is somewhere lost in the great white north. That's all we know. He might join us here at some point. He may or may not be on the way back to civilization so that he can join us on Zoom. I think he was at the border, clawing at the border to trying to get in. (laughs) I hear that's going to be opening up soon, so he may be legally here among us soon. This is our 100th podcast. Do 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 100. <laughs> when we started in April of 2013, we were the only Land Rover related podcast and now there's the there's Rover Talk, the Bear Mark Chit Chat, the Wave with Rudolf Dante and the Under Power Hour which we failed to mention last month. There's room for us all, so good luck to everybody uh, in your in your podcast endeavors. Yeah, I think there's enough hours in the day for everybody's show to get a good listen. Yeah, we continue to be a monthly podcast and talk a long time, as is this episode, which I will tell you about in just a moment. Yeah, it, it ain't brief, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, we have a number of things going on to note the 100th podcast. We have two guests. Uh, first is Maurice Merrick. He's the host of the Horsepower Heritage. He has a very well-done episode on the development of Land Rover and how it became an icon. And you'll hear him later in this specific edition of the Center Steer podcast file. I'm calling it a file because there's going to be a second file. Why is there a second file? There's going to be a release of a, of a second show, the 100th, and we'll call it, let's call it 100A. Let's follow, let's follow series convention instead of, you know, series two, series two A. Or it could be episode 100 series two. Oh, there's Ooh. an idea. You're listening now to the series one, I suppose, of the 100th episode. There will be a series two with Bill Burke. Bill Burke is our second guest this month. He is an off-road and Land Rover legend. Let's just call him a legend. I think it's time to call him a legend. He is Yoda. <laughs> he participated <laughs> in the 1991 Camel Trophy. We asked Bill for a deep dive into his participation, and that is exactly what we got. We got a deep dive. Yeah, there was very deep. Two hours. Actually, it's like one hour and 57 minutes on it when I finally cut it all down. It's a very good talk about what happened leading up to the Camel Trophy in 1991, how he got there, the things that he had to go through, the, the, the different stages and steps that you need to become a participant and how that happens, and then the various things that occurred and happened during the Camel Trophy itself, how the American team was in the lead for good part of the time and why and then you know what happened at the end which i don't think i didn't know until i heard bill talk about it that there was a a big rush at the end for them to get to safety because there was some internal strife in burundi at the time so you get to hear all that and that took us is that almost two hours and so there will be a series two of the 100th podcast or maybe a podcast 100a however you want to look at it and we will release that within within a day of this podcast so once i get everything all arranged, we'll get it pushed out to you. And next in our 100th podcast activities, we've partnered with Retro 80 for a special design for the 100th podcast. The design will be available in a sticker and a t-shirt and a print and stickers will be available through the Center Steer website. 
for the t-shirts and the print, Retro 80 is going to handle that. And I'll be completely upfront and open with everyone. For the t-shirts, we're going to do a pre-order. We're not sure how many we're going to sell and we don't know how what the demand will be like. And depending on the demand, anywhere around the world, shipping is going to come into play. So we're going to do a pre-order. You have until September 8th to order the t-shirt. We will have the design will be on the Retro 80 site. And of course, you'll have a link from the center steer page to that. And then you will pre-order the shirt. I believe there's going to be, we've, I think we settled on, there's going to be two colors of the shirt. So you can pick which one you want. You'll pick the size you want, how many you want. Maybe you want more than one. I think it's a really cool design. Uh, Dan did a fantastic job. So we'll do the pre-order. That'll go through September 8th. And then once we see how many, how much demand there is, how many shirts are needed, if it's necessary, and there's a lot of orders from North America, then uh, they'll get printed here in the U.S. and then we'll ship them from here with slightly less uh, cheaper shipping. If then the orders that are necessary, maybe in Europe, will come out of the U.K. If there's a handful of shirts, and then they'll all get shipped out of the U.K., you know, printed and shipped out of the U.K., where shipping is a little more, it's almost double the cost of shipping here uh, from the U.S. Unless we can find somebody with some extra space in a suitcase that's making a trip. <laughs> Yeah, the Rover Underground Railroad. I think I'm going to order one in each color, one for day wear and one for evening wear. (laughs) And our Patreon supporters will get a 15% discount on the new design. In addition to, we're going to have prints available. Since Dan does prints of his designs, we're going to do the same thing for the new Center Steer or a special, it's not really a new logo. It's I, I, in my head, I call it a new logo, but it's not. It's a special design for the 100th episode. And that will be available also in a print. And Dan will handle that, of course, uh, from his website because he's he actually gets to print those himself. He has the capability to do that, so they'll come out of they'll come out of the UK on those. So that is the special Retro 80 partnering design that we have, and that will be you know go to go to the Center Steer website. We'll have a link to Retro 80. And of course, we'll have the stickers available. And uh, as we go out to different events, we'll also have stickers with us. We will not have t-shirts, but we will definitely have stickers with us if you see us at Mar or British Invasion or wherever other events take us in the upcoming year. We should make clear, though, that these are coming from Retro 80, yet we are Center Steer 100. We should have done it 20 episodes ago. I will forgo the usual check us out on all the socials and check send your, your emails uh, because we want to talk about going to the vintage grand prix this weekend also an additional gift for the 100th we're gonna we'll skip all that you know how to get get in contact with us if you're a new listener go to our website there's ways to contact us if you uh to to be involved in in the podcast this month is the vintage grand prix in pittsburgh pvgp as we like to call it not we they call it the pittsburgh vintage grand prix it is the I believe still the only vintage racing that takes place on city streets in North America. We believe there's another one taking place somewhere else in the world. I believe you are correct. And we had a very respectable showing of Land Rovers for British Car Day, which is part of International Car Day as part of the weekend that is the racing that takes place uh, on city streets, which is uh, part of that is, is if you were new to the podcast, uh, that is on a, the, on a golf course and they close part of the streets around the golf course and some other city streets for the racing to take place. During the final race today, they had a, a, a car go over a hill. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh yeah, because the, it, it does happen. The driver had to be life lighted to the hospital. I do not know uh, what happened, but uh, we do know that the car left the track and went into the, we think the woods of some sort. And that was not the only accident of the day. Oh, there was another one. There were others. I guess I, I yeah. was, I didn't get to see the, all the racing. So I missed some of that stuff. Mishaps do occur. Yeah. We always hope that no one gets hurt, but, but sometimes there's, there's an injury, but quite often it's just an offing and then they just put it back on and keep on going. There was an XKE in the a Jag XKE in the final race, which was uh, pretty cool. It, it didn't win. I think it was a, I think BMW took the first two slots, if I'm not mistaken, for today's official race. And we had a Land Rover related individual who was the Grand Marshal of the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, Kate Gunlock, who is the daughter of Land Rover friends, Mark and Lisa Love. And she was the Grand Marshal. And uh, I believe she got to ride in the pace car for the, the initial lap before the racing started. They have a parade lap. And she, she did that. Plus they had some dinners and things. And so she came into town for that. She is a form, Formula One engineer, car engineer. Uh, she She's a race engineer for an IndyCar team. 
And as I said, there was a respectable showing of Land Rover showed up. We had every make and model, I believe, was there, right? We had, there was uh, no right? series one. Mark, wait, Mark's is a series one, is it not? No. no, it's a series two, right? That's a two A. Two A. So we had two A, we had a three, we had a uh, Range Rover, Range Rover Classic. We had, I think, a Range Rover Sport. New Defenders uh, were there. And my Series 3 took my Defender. Harold took his Defender. And a very special, I was very excited. You guys weren't. But there was a Freelander <laughs> showed up. An actual Freelander participated in the actual G4. So we will endeavor to have him on the show to talk about that G4, talk about the G4 and talk about the Freelander and his participation in it. Cause well, I think, I think he merits being on the show just by being the operator of a Freelander that still runs. Yeah. And surprisingly, I discovered that uh, the G4 event, at least that particular stage for that year uh, had a camp over in Southern Vermont in the green mountains. So that was pretty cool. Your home state. It is. That, that That is near where you are keeping your Series 3 project, is it not? It is. Well, as far as representation within the Land Rover world, I think you're right. I think we did have a pretty good comprehensive coverage, but we're, we were missing notably the Series 1. And oh, Of course, we would have had Oxford last year had it happened. That would have been cool. But uh, Series 1s and forward controls. But, you know, usually what happens, Harold, is we get two, get two gentlemen who come up every year and introduce themselves again and say, I have that forward control still sitting in my garage. <laughs> that didn't well, happen this year. <laughs> bring it out, dude. <laughs> so I have an idea around the Vintage Grand Prix for 2023, and I'm asking you to stay around to the end of the show, and we'll explain what it is. You're going to have two years to prepare for 2023. I'm inviting all of our listeners to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in 2023. So you have two years to prepare and a couple hours to wait until you hear more details. And now time for the news. Jaguar Land Rover still hit by chip shortage as latest sales figures reveal. And this was posted on the 22nd of July. The reason I mentioned that is things changing rapidly in this part of the space. So JLR is being hit by the global shortage of semiconductors that had been had a major impact on the global automotive industry. The Coventry car maker recently revealed its latest sales figures, which were up year on year, but said it was unable to keep up with demand because of the chip issue. Retail sales for the first quarter ending on July 30th were 124,537 vehicles, 68% higher than vehicles sold for the same period in 2020. Retail sales were higher year on year in every key region, including the UK, which was up 187%. <laughs> Europe was up 124%, overseas up 71, North America up 50, and China was up 14%. Retail sales of all models other than the Jag XE were higher year on year, and sales of the new Defender continued to climb with 17,194 vehicles sold in the first quarter. So what you're saying is that the sales went up by the smallest margin in their biggest market. Yes. Interesting. But I think that's also been recovering faster than it recovered the rest of the world, I think. That's probably why that's okay. the case. That, yeah, that could be. Right. And the UK was impacted the most by the lockdown. It's, it's interesting that they're selling like crazy and yet they can't build them. It's a good problem to have. Um, well, yeah, yeah, usually. <laughs> yeah. On the surface, I it's mean, a good problem need, to have. You still need cash coming in, so it's yeah. hard to say. But. Uh, not including its Chinese joint venture with Carmaker car maker Cherry, JLR sold 84,442 units in the quarter, up 73% year on year. However, for the company, this was about 30,000 units lower than otherwise would have been planned as a result of the semiconductor supply constraints and impact of COVID, although this reduction had been broadly anticipated. Looking ahead, JLR said the chip shortage is difficult to forecast. Based on recent input from suppliers, it said it now expects chip supply shortages in the second quarter to the end of September to be greater than in the first quarter. The company said it expects the situation to start to improve in the second half of, the phys of this physical financial year, but it added that it expects some level of shortages will continue through the end of the year and beyond. Given the ongoing shortage, JLR says it will continue to prioritize production of higher margin vehicles as well as make chip and product specification changes where possible to reduce the impact. The company said it, that it currently has about 110,000 global retail orders, the highest in the history of the company. So yes, the chip shortage, significant impact. Everything would be going, they'd be selling, they couldn't, you couldn't keep uh, new defenders on the lot 
if it wasn't for the chip shortage. Right. And it sounds like that's going to get a little worse before it gets better. I, I think it makes sense for them to uh, try to produce the highest end models so that they have the most capital to work with. But that's going to hurt for the Defender because that's not necessarily the highest end models. Oh, no, I think they're going to prioritize towards the highest margin of, uh, that, of the Defender. So you're going to see the X model or the XS model, those ones where they make a lot of margin on the... Right. That makes sense. Especially for the Defender, since there's so damn many computers in it. They've got to get maximum return on their allocation of chips by selling the versions of the Defender that make them the most money. The latest quarterly results from JLR show the new Land Rover Defender is now outselling all JLR models except the Evoke. The new Defender outsold every car in Land Rover's range except the Evoke. And, and it nearly beat it too. In the process, it uh, outsold the Discovery by almost three to one with sales 17,194 with some 30,000 orders for the Defender in a 100,000 order bank. Yeah, it really makes you wonder what the future of the Disco is going to be. It does. We will talk about that actually uh, in a few minutes because uh, the Terry Bellare made some comments this month and he referenced the Discovery. But before we get to that, job losses at JLR with redundancies confirmed at Halwood Factory. JLR wants staff at its Halwood plant to take voluntary redundancy due to the unprecedented challenges of the coronavirus pandemic. The Halwood plant of JLR is in Merseyside, and a statement from the center has now confirmed that it's asking staff for voluntary for volunteers to take redundancy. Did they say whether it's going to be factory workers or managers? I can't remember. I vaguely recall something along the lines of, of it being mostly management. I believe that was the last time they talked about this. I, this mm, one, I didn't see yes. that here in this article unless I missed it, but I do believe it was in the previous redundancy, voluntary redundancy, they were for, or not voluntary redundancies. They were looking at man management. Right. And that was also part of the restructuring from Bellaro taking over. Speaking of Bellari, this is a really good article. Uh, this is from Autocar and it's entitled How JLR Boss Terry Bellari Will Reinvent Britain's Biggest Car Firm. And I encourage you to read it because uh, there's you can learn more about uh, who Terry Bellari is and how he functions and how he thinks. Uh, but I will pull out some parts that I thought were relevant to the podcast and to JLR in particular. So, of course, Bellare is a serious and determined man. How could you not be when one of the first decisions is to kill the new JAG project, the XJ, that cost years and billions and embodied the best work of many good people, replacing it with the JAG EV revival plan, so radical that it almost defies assessment. Yet I don't believe I've met a CEO in recent times with such a frequent and friendly smile who remains so patiently willing to explain in even greater detail detail plans he has already explained many times before or who signals so readily that from here on progress at JLR will depend mostly on the fighting spirit of a workforce he already regards as exceptional. Bellari's revival plan, dubbed Reimagine, concentrates on reviving Jaguar via early and wholesale electrification of a smaller range of models, radical in design, and much more expensive. When he knew that he had the CEO's job, Bellari spent the whole month of August in Brittany, finessing Reimagine and meeting his new management team remotely. He started officially in September, this would have been 2020, last year, spending the first two days driving the latest cars with the JLR's chief engineer and brand attributes guru, quote, it was clear Land Rover was a fantastic success, but still had a lot of potential. Jaguar, it was damaged. The cars were great. They'd never been, they've never been so good, but their positioning was not appropriate, unquote. And that was all Bellari saying that. Continuing with a quote from him, before we consider Jaguar, let's look at Range Rover. The pricing is very satisfactory and we have impressive volumes. Our positioning for the model is unique. So the thinking with Jaguar is that in future, we do the same thing with a range of distinctive, high desirable electric cars built on a principle of modern luxury, Looking forward, not back. As Sir William Lyons said, a Jaguar is a copy of nothing. When the E-Type was revealed, no one could have anticipated such a design. We will use the same principles. We will offer great design, technology, and refinement. With the new models, we will aim to generate a level of desire, similar to Range Rover, with completely different shapes, of course. We have already chosen our family of cars in terms of design, unquote. Continue on about Jaguar. Quote, because if you listen to the customer who wants to test an F-Pace, you will soon see the problem. They drive the car and discuss the price. Maybe they're impressed, but they go out and buy an original SUV, an Audi or a BMW. That's the problem. Our models are designed to match BMW, but we are not BMW. 
why would you buy the Jaguar, which isn't the Jaguar you dreamed about, unquote. I think they should go back to designing and planning at night with the blackout curtains drawn because they're being shelled by the Germans. Polari specifically dismissed any suggestions that a Jaguar is an old person's car, pointing out that the Sir William Lyons Mark succeeded early in life with the exact the same... The, with exactly the opposite positioning by selling innovation, breakthroughs, and breathtaking design that no one anticipated. Jaguar has already said it will use a single platform shared with a partner for all three of its models, a move that makes you wonder whether one day the donor might want to acquire the whole Jaguar mark. That's a parenthetical statement in this article. But there's no news yet with about which manufacturer might contribute the all-important underpinnings. That's kind of a return to their roots in a way, because the very first, uh, well, back when they were swallow sidecars, their first cars were just rebodies of the Austin 7. So that was a donor platform that they built their own body on. We will leave it late to question the new CEO on the reasons for one of his most controversial changes, the amalgamation of all JLR design under head Jerry McGovern, newly promoted chief creative officer, all designers now working on everything, but why? Quote, we have done it to boost creativity, Barlar explains, and to make certain that what we do with Jaguar is a copy of nothing. To start the Jaguar program and deploy all of our creativity, we organize our designers into three groups. I can't yet describe their actual projects, but we have given them full freedom and asked them to work intensively for three months. As for Jerry's new role, you really need uh, someone who can beat the drum for change, and there's nobody better, unquote. Well, nobody pounds it louder, that's for sure. So there you go. That's the relevant stuff I pulled out. Uh, again, I encourage you to read the the entire article because it's, it's, it's interesting, especially if you're interested in the future specifically of Jaguar and where it's going and how uh, Bolare thinks and where he comes from. Sounds like uh, he made a bold move in canceling their, their current plans. And, and really, I think what they're going to do is drive it up market again. Well, I think they have to. I think they have to. But yeah, it's, it's bold for him to come in and make such a drastic change basically the first week in office. I think it's just nice to see the Jag brand getting some attention because I think it's been somewhat neglected or or maybe deferred on on what it needed to do and it's been sort of languishing for a while so i think it's good to see somebody realizing that they really needed to do some big steps to to change for sure uh, one other thing to mention here specifically around land rover in the Bellari article and this was like a special little call out they had at the end of the article and it says positioning the land rover discovery <laughs> and this is a quote at first i also asked myself what's unique about it and tested it many times because i didn't understand its role but now i see the discovery has a very definite market space for modern families we will work to make that clear unquote so, yeah, sounds like he uh, wonders about what's going on with the Discovery, too, and wants that to, to be yeah. made clear. As we as we all do. But they can't do anything with it now while they're having a chip shortage. Right. Well, everything takes time, too. It, it's, you know, it's the development cycle is not an instant thing. It sounds like if they're positioning it for the modern family, they've already worked a fair amount for that, but maybe they need to market it better for that specifically. Yeah, because I think the current thing it has is just it has seven seats. And if you're thinking of extending or going to extend the Defender and add in better seven seats there, then once again, why do you have a discovery? Right. Uh, well, I think that I think the design is is kind of at the core of it. I think you need to distinguish it. Well, it's, obviously, it's distinguished from the Defender, but you need to distinguish it from the Range Rover. I think it needs to be more urban than the Defender, but less luxury upmarket than, than the Range Rover is. And I just don't think it does that very well with the look it has now. Yeah, I, I, that's a that's a good point. I think we've talked about this before, but I suspect I have this feeling like this Range Rover will go further up market. It'll go into the north of six figures for all models. And then I think that leaves a space for Discovery to move up into the former Range Rover brand. I guess that makes Range Rover super premium. Well, I mean, in order to make enough room for the Discovery to be a mid-range, you have to push the high end up. Right. And they've already pushed the high end down with the Range Rover Sport, the Evoque, all of that, where they're treading on the Discovery territory. Well, and I think that's really a lot of the problem is there's so much proliferation of Range Rover that it's stepping into Discovery space. And and it was one thing when there wasn't a Defender, but now that there's a Defender, that's crimping the, the Discovery from the other direction. 
A little interesting thing on styling, especially when it comes to Discovery with Disco 5 and we're on. I was watch, I saw a commercial. First time I saw it, when I saw this commercial, it was a car commercial. And you probably see where I'm going with this. I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a Discovery commercial. Nope. It was a Nissan Pathfinder. The rear, it was the rear. And I thought the first time when I saw it, I was like, wait a minute, that's a, nope, it's a Nissan, Path, Nissan Pathfinder. Like, so I don't know, maybe Jerry was ahead of his time. People are starting to copy the Disco. Well, I mean, the 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 Xterris co- kind of copied, wasn't it the Xterra? Was it the Pathfinder that copied the rear door of the the old Discos with the, the stepped, they had that box on the back for their first aid kit or whatever they put in there, but it had that same line. Yeah, that was yeah. the Xterra. Well, next up, we move off of Land Rover specific news to two countries are moving in, uh, have updated their ICE bans, their internal combustion engine bans, Britain to ban all new diesel and petrol heavy goods vehicles from 2024. So Britain will ban the sale of new petrol and diesel heavy goods from 2024 as part of a broader package of green initiatives aimed at achieving net zero emissions from all forms of transport 10 years later. The government said that it would ban the sale of smaller diesel trucks from 2035 and larger ones weighing more than 26 tons from 2040 or earlier if feasible. So no rolling coal in your lorries. They had not talked about trucks before. Cars had been discussed before in the UK and I believe that was also 2035 right if i remember correctly yeah the, the heavy truck is a new new development definitely yeah and then canada to ban sale of new fuel powered cars and light trucks from 2035 canada will ban the sale of fuel burning new cars and light duty trucks from 2035 in an effort to reach net zero emissions across the country by 2050 only zero emission cars and trucks can be sold from 2035 in canada yeah and they're trying to sort of align themselves with California and the rest of the U.S. timelines there. And by the time you uh, hear this podcast, I will have updated our banning of ice list on the on the website. And then Land Rover launches long wheelbase Evoque SUV in China. Land Rover has launched a long wheelbase variant of its Evoque compact SUV in China, the Range Rover Evoque L increases rear leg room by 125 millimeters, 4.9 inches, and offers an electrically adjustable rear seat back to allow passengers to stretch out further, according to the brand's consumer's website. Long wheelbase versions of global models are popular in China, where many buyers there prefer more rear seat space. The Evoque was JLR's second best-selling locally produced model with 3,642 sales in China after the Discovery Sport at 5,600 units. Company figures for the quarter ending July 30 show. And this just in, Dixon has joined us. The Skycreeper has arrived. Greetings. How are you, sir? Not too bad. So you've joined us in the middle of the news. Welcome to the 100th episode of the podcast. Do, 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 do. 100. Well, I could say I was late because I was out getting Land Rover parts. So as one does on a good day. That's right. Excellent. Good to have you part of the podcast. We were worried that you had been arrested at the border trying to cross into the U.S. Nope. Still, well, as of uh, Tuesday, it'll be 500 days of no no 80 inch in my <laughs> life. It's been it's been trying. Day 500 of its captivity. That's right. On behalf of the United States of America, I apologize, Dixon. <laughs> I have a remedy for that. I hope I do. Uh, it's in it's in two years' time, and we'll explain more at the end of the show. So stick around, Dixon. I shall. Next up in the news is a article from Jalopnik that is the 2021 Land Rover Defender 90 gives you something the Wrangler can't. I'm not going to read the article, but if you are thinking of purchasing a D90 and you want to know more about it, I recommend this article, especially if you're here in North America. There's nothing in the article that when I read it, that was really anything new that we haven't heard, but I did want to let you know that it's out there. If you're considering purchasing a 90, it might be a good reference for you. Yeah. And and just in quick summary, they basically feel that it's a little too luxurious. So it's not a, not a glowing review, but it's worth reading. Must be they didn't uh, get the commercial 90. Uh, No. No. And then uh, this is the Land Rover lineup changes. And Motor Trend has an article where they track all the changes for the different models. And I figure, why don't we just roll through them pretty quickly? This is for 2022. First up, the Disco Sport, Land Rover's most affordable priced offering, receives additional standard features that consist of wireless device charging, heated front seats, a power liftgate, and keyless entry. Otsutni, 
There's a pearl white color <laughs> and a bronze metallic exterior paint colors have been added to the palette and an optional third row pack features third row seating and cooling vents, as well as USB ports for first, second and third row passengers. Of course, this is all, I think this was written before the hearing more about the chip challenge uh, that they have. So I think some of these things may not happen <laughs> unless they get the chip stuff sorted out. Uh, next, the Evoke. The Evoke rides on the same platform as the Sport and not surprisingly receives some of the same updates. Heated front seats, wireless smartphone charging with signal booster, power lift gate, keyless entry becomes standard for 2022. We say so long to the Yulong White, which gets replaced by the exterior color Ostuni Pearl White. It's O-S-T-U-N-I. I'm not sure how to say that word. Eliminating white and adding white. Yes, it's... it's okay, just, just making sure. A different white. It's Yulong White being replaced by an Ostuni Pearl White. Okay, well, that's fine. Well, I understand here. Why don't you get the difference? <laughs> it's the uh, lastly, the HST trim level joins the lineup and is outfitted with exclusive features such as a 296 horsepower Turbo 4 mild hybrid powertrain, 20-inch gloss black wheels, red brake calipers, painted black roof, and black exterior accents. That is your 2022 Range Rover Evoque. The Defender 2022 Defender brings with it an exciting addition and available supercharged V8. It's the same 518 horsepower eight cylinder unit from the Range Rover and the Sport lineups. Previously only came with the 296 horsepower Turbo 4 or the 395 horsepower Turbo 6 mount hybrid. Uh, when equipped with the V8, the Defender uses the same eight speed automatic transmission as the other powertrains and sends power to an updated four wheel drive system outfitted with new electronic rear differential. New stiffer bushings and larger anti-sway bars are incorporated incorporated in the chassis to mitigate the burlier engine. So when they announced that the Defender was only going to come with a four and a six cylinder, I knew it would only be a matter of time before it was available with eight. And here we are. For probably a short period of time. At least for maybe three or four years, maybe five. <laughs> Longer than they were available in this country before. True. But also should be said that ICE engines are not necessarily being outlawed in the U.S. yet. I mean, there are certainly some places in specific states, but not as a country. Correct. So you may see being able to buy one in Pennsylvania, but not in California. So you can you can still, you can have your new Defender uh, registered to a Montana LLC alongside your legacy Defender registered to a Montana LLC. The other big Defender news is the expansion of the lineup. X Dynamic SE and X Dynamic HSE have been added to the two-door Defender 90 model range, and two new additions have been introduced, the Defender 110 XS Special and V8 Carpathian. And that is the, le the letter X and the letter S. Yes, it sounds like XS. New available option bundles include the Bright Pack, Extended Bright Pack, and Extended Black Pack. And Land Rover now offers standard wireless device charging and an available 11.4 inch touchscreen infotainment display if you want something bigger than a standard 10 inch screen. And actually I saw somebody post on Facebook today that they had just gotten the, the 11 inch size one. So maybe it's available in already. So the, the Defender offers a screen that goes to 11. <laughs> That's your 2022 Land Rover Defender. Now the 2022 Discovery. The fifth generation Discovery received a significant refresh in 2021 and consequently saw zero changes for 2022. The Velar. Details have yet to be released about any changes to the 2022 Velar, but the stylish crossover did receive a big update in 2021. The Range Rover Sport for 2022. It's all about simplification for the Range Rover Sport. Powertrain options are cut down to two a mild hybrid turbo six and a supercharged V8, each consuming in two states of tunes. That means last year's 254 horsepower, three liter turbo six, turbo diesel six, and the 398 horsepower, two liter turbo four plug-in hybrid have been put out to pasture. USB-C ports for second row passengers are also available this year. That's your 2022 Range Rover Sport. Finally, their full-size Range Rover. The Range Rover is another model that doesn't see any changes for 2022, but benefited from minor updates the previous year. And we know that the new uh, full-size Range Rover is coming soon. Speaking of the Defender, the 2022 Land Rover Defender V8, gloriously excessive. This is from Car and Driver. So I'll read you some excerpts from this. But the new 2022 Defender V8 models with their 518 horsepower supercharged 5-liter engines bring outsized character and should trim at least a second from the time. It's the 060 time. With six figures starting prices, these new range-topping variants prove that the Defender only gets better with more cylinders under its hood. <laughs> well... 
most things do. I think that's a great tagline, <laughs> isn't it? It gets better with more cylinders under its hood. Compared with lesser defenders, the V8's visual cues are limited, amounting to slightly chunkier body cladding, smaller badges at the base of the doors, and quad tailpipes tucked beneath the rear bumper. There are also blue brake calipers at the front. And the way the Defender's chassis handles the engine's full thrust is as impressive as it as its raw performance, with little of the nose-up attitude common to tall, powerful SUVs. We drove the V8 models in England, and traction was impeccable on dry pavement, the Defender launching hard and without drama on its used 22-inch Continental all-terrain tires. At idle and light cruising, substantial sound insulation makes the engine noise nearly inaudible. <laughs> Let's pause to, <laughs> to laugh at the fun out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, comparing that to, to OG uh, defenders. At a steady 75 mile per hour, only a slight rustling of wind from the top of the bluffy angled windshield disturbs the tranquility. That is a sentence written by car and driver about a Land Rover that it's said, it's said let's read it again at a steady 75 miles per hour. Only a slight rustling of wind from the top of the bluffly angled windscreen disturbs the tranquility. Which is interesting because when you drive a legacy Defender, it's it's all about the engine and transmission noise. And then when you get to that speed, the wind noise becomes such that you cannot hear said deafening engine and transmission anymore. It's a very good observation. <laughs> And to conclude here, the seriousness of the Defender V8's performance is matched by its price. The two-door 90 starts at $104,260, and the four-door 110 at $107,460, roughly double the cost of their respective base four-cylinder models. That's a significant premium over the most obvious alternative, the $75,000 470 horsepower Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 392, Although the Defender is quite a bit more refined and the V8s are still significantly cheaper than a Mercedes G-Class, which is $134,000. And they're significantly cheaper than a well-restored Legacy Defender 110. I mean, those ain't cheap anymore either. So that is your Defender V8. Uh, wait till SVR gets to it. Once, once they go bowling with it. Speaking of which, uh, 2023 Land Rover Defender SVR brings the heat with a 600 horsepower V8. As hot as the off-roader is though, our 2021 SUV of the year, and this is from Motor Trend also, is really just getting started, especially if you're a fan of hugely powerful SUVs. The lineup already includes four-cylinder V6, V8 models, but the forthcoming SVR will build on the Defender V8 with more horsepower, sportier design elements, and unique suspension tuning to deliver the ultimate street version. Platform and powertrain. The Defender SVR will naturally use the same modular longitudinal architecture as its lesser kin, but we hear it'll pack a different engine with the non-SVR V8. That model uses Land Rover's long-serving 5-liter supercharged V8 to sump up 518 horsepower, but the SVR may raise BMW bin and leverage the Bavarian's 4.4 liter turbo twin turbo V8 for 600 plus horses, a meaningful bump up from the regular V8. Both BMW and JLR use ZF eight speed automatic transmission, which should make overall powertrain calibration easier. And BMW's more modern engine will help JLR pass even stricter global emission regulations. Estimated price. It's likely you will need to cough up $125,000 American to get into the basic Defender 90 SVR. Think 130,000 K for the 110 and options and accessories. We'll push the sticker up from there. All right. Who's getting an SVR? Not this year or next. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to come up with about 800 horsepower and launch control. Then I might start thinking about it. All right. That's uh, modern Land Rover news. Let's talk about the original Land Rover news. Godfather of the Land Rover still alive and kicking in Australia. Or perhaps we should call him the Goddard father. Arthur Goddard was the chief engineer behind the first Land Rover, the man who turned the vision of Rover's technical di director, Maurice Wilkes, into a road-going country bashing four wheel drive in 10 months. Speaking to the team from Engage 4x4, a new monthly Australian automotive magazine, Arthur remembered those momentous days in 1947 and 48 as though it was yesterday. I'll read some excerpts here. Honestly, Arthur says, quote, I could pick people to do the jobs. I didn't have to be all that good myself because I had a suspension man I could pull over from the Rover car line, a steering man, and so forth. We gave people what they wanted. It pleased a lot of people, and it kept on pleasing people. 
We met a need. I must say that some of the needs we met, we didn't know were there. On the one hand, some of the stuff we thought we'd be an absolute winner was an absolute wolf, unquote. He chuckles. But the Land Rover chassis was all new. Quote, the chassis made it possible. You haven't got a complete body, but you want a frame on which to mount everything. That was the engineering problem. What does the frame look like? It looks like nothing you've ever seen before, unquote. And then he said it was a bloody miracle, which Wilkes, who wanted the job completed inside 12 months, got the first Land Rover in 10. He's still proud of the teamwork and admits the biggest mistake was not adding eight inches to the original wheelbase of 80 inches. Tried to copy the Jeep a little too closely, I think. Well, the first one was on a Jeep chassis. Right. And the Jeep was 80 inches. So I'm just saying they they stuck to that a little bit too religiously. They added in the back first for a larger load bed and then the front two inches came so they could put a longer motor in for the diesel. Right. So I have reached out to Engage 4x4 to get them on the program to talk about their new monthly automotive magazine, because I think it's also available in the U.S. I have not heard from them. So if you are are part of the Engage 4x4 magazine, give us a shout. We'll get you on the program so people can learn about your magazine. Finally in the news, uh, this is about the Grenadier. Here's everything you need to know about the Enos Grenadier. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, just some specific things that I think are new that we have not heard before. The Enos Grenadier is powered by BMW. It's going to be offered with a two inline six motors, either gas or diesel. The gasoline will pump out 281 horsepower, 332 pound-feet of torque. The diesel will turn out 245 horsepower and a healthy 400 pound-feet of torque. Both the engines will be coupled to an 8-speed ZF automatic gearbox, which happens to be the weapon of choice in Beamers using the same inline six motors. It comes with BMW's electronic shifter, and the Grenadier has a permanent all-wheel drive layout with a two-speed transfer case and three differential locks. The Grenadier is built on a ladder frame chassis with beam axles, which is the perfect base for a capable off-roader. Uh, yeah, there's new stuff here about the interior. It's the first time we've seen interior stuff. The dashboard looks like serious business with a lot of toggles wrapped around durable, rugged materials. The aircon vents might look dated, but the floating 12.3-inch touchscreen infotainment system runs on BMW's famed iDrive interface, but with a revamped interface that matches Grenadier's ruggedness. The Enos has rubberized the flooring and given it drain plugs to, you know, drain out the water after your intensive river run. It comes with Recaro seats wrapped with durable wipe down upholstery. Enos also gives you the option to go uh, for leather upholstery. It also comes with a plethora of switch gear positioned on the dash and on the roof with which pre-wired auxiliary switches for various add-on equipment. Dimensionally, it's slightly wider but shorter than the old long wheelbase Defender. Apart from the long wheelbase option, the Grenadier will also be offered with in a crew cab pickup body style at launch. A short wheelbase model will soon follow. Pricing, as of now, Enos is extensively torture testing around 130 prototypes of the Grenadier around the world. Enos will initially launch the Grenadier in Europe next year. They will begin to accept reservations from October 21. Deliveries will start in July of 2022. We expect the Grenadier to launch in the U.S. by early 2023, the 75th anniversary of Land Rover, might I add. Enos plans to pitch their off-roader in between the likes of the affordable Ford Bronco and the luxury Mercedes-Benz G-Class, so expect a price of around $80,000 to $120,000 American. Gee, that that price range sounds familiar. If, if If you're going there, you might want to go for an SVR. The ladder frame chassis with beam axle sounds familiar, too. It does. They point out it being the ideal for for off-roading, as evidenced by 67 years of Land Rover production. And that's the news for July 2021. First up will be our conversation with Maurice Merrick of Horsepower Heritage, talking about Land Rover and accidental icon. And as I said before, we will re- release our second guest, Bill Burke, will be released as a second file within a day of this podcast being published. And now... Maurice Merrick. And now to help celebrate the 100th episode of the Sinister Podcast is Maurice Merrick. He's host of the Horsepower Heritage Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Maurice. John and Morgan, thanks for having me. Great pleasure. It is wonderful to have you. The reason I wanted to have you on the podcast, I believe it was Dixon who turned me on to your podcast, Horsepower Heritage, and your aptly numbered episode number 007 is Land Rover, an accidental icon. And it is 
fantastic. I thought it was a great, excellent introduction to the development of the Land Rover and how it became an icon. I thought it was a per- perfect time to have you on the show for the Celebrating Our 100th uh, podcast to help talk about the Land Rover and where it came from. So welcome to the show. And for just, for what a great podcast. Thank you. I, I'm so gratified that you enjoyed the episode. And for me, the episode was difficult in ways to produce. And on, on the one hand, I'm a 25 plus year owner of series Land Rovers. So it's very close to my heart and you want to do it justice. At the same time, you can't be too much of a rivet counter because you're playing to a wider audience. And so if I get too deep in the weeds, I lose people who aren't initiated, right? So how do you explain the significance, the passion and the character and the, and the capabilities of this, this amazing vehicle to those who may have never been off the road, right? They've only driven street cars or uh, they've only driven road cars. And so kind of a big task to serve two masters in this way. Like you want the Land Rover people to enjoy it and validate it. And at the same time, you want that wider audience to understand what you're talking about. So it was a challenge, but it was a challenge that I really enjoyed. And I'm glad you liked the episode. Very much so. I thought very well done. You, you go even, you go back before Land Rover started in 47, talking about the reasons why Land Rover came about as it did. And you, know, you, you, you go back so far to the bicycle, which actually something I didn't know that Rover, the Rover car company was involved in bicycles. Being even being a Land Rover person, I learned something. Right. And especially in North America, people are unaware that the Rover company built a very fine quality automobile for many years before the Land Rover. And the Land Rover as we always say, the Land Rover was really just meant as a stopgap and they were going to quit building them as soon as they got back on their feet. So to have that backstory, you know, you, you, to my mind, you cannot tell the full story of Land Rover without telling of the origins of the Rover company itself. Land Rover begat Range Rover, which we all, I mean, we, we here in the podcast know that's the same, but without uh, having the Land Rover originally, you would not have the Range Rover. People wanted more creature comfort and they wanted the ability to be more of an, have an off-roader, but be, but be comfortable on road. And this is so that in many ways, Land Rover started this whole SUV four by four craze. So I think there was one before that, but, but I think, you know, Land Rover kind of pushed that forward with, uh, especially with the, I think the Range Rover. Absolutely. I mean, the Range Rover established that luxury four wheel drive class. There have been imitators as there were with the series Land Rover. And I mean, I think we all can acknowledge that Land Rover was eclipsed in the 1960s by other brands like Toyota, for example. Sure. And there's a lot of market reasons for that. And, and there's a, there was, a, of course, a lot of strife within the British automotive industry that contributed to that. But for the character and the, um, the daring do, I don't think you can beat a Land Rover. And, and actually, you, that point makes Land Rover all the more special because of what the, the British motoring industry had to go through, the consolidation and the changes and the, the lack of resources. And yet they came out with, you know, the Range Rover and then they came out with, an, you know, the Discovery and they came out with the Freelander and they kept the Defender going, you know, it was really, let's call it series four. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, they kept that going and with, with all this being starved of resources, yet it still continued, uh, which is the good and the bad. Cause in, on the one, in one hand, they kept it going as, as it is, as it was until 2016, but also being starved of resources didn't allow that, uh, maturing of the of the vehicle, to, especially specifically the the series Defender, to advance as it should have. So I guess there's the good the good and the bad of that. I'm, I'm trying to make a good good thing out of it, but there's also a negative side to it, I suppose. You know, you made an interesting point about how budgets were tight and resources were were thin at Land Rover, and this is a theory I've held for a long time, and I I can't really substantiate it with any evidence per se, but the ingenuity and creativity and simplicity of the, the original Land Rover, 
I think was born out of that starvation. They had to figure out really cool and simple ways to do things. So for example, if you look at things like tailgate latches, or you look at the way that uh, a soft top is fastened on a Land Rover, I mean, I could go on and on about different details, but to my mind, those things were born out of that starvation. And it really made the vehicle uh, what it is. If, if not for that starvation, I really wonder if Land Rover would have been as successful and now venerated as it is. I think it's an ex- that's an excellent question. And I, sus- I think not <laughs> because it probably would have been more along the lines of General Motors and Toyota making mass producing lots of cars for lots of people. And so therefore kind of uh, uh, making it more of an average vehicle than making it something special and unique. And as we were discussing the Range Rover, it it sort of carried over into the Range Rover itself, where they started with the the technical implementation and and even the design was sort of their engineering design. But everybody loved it so much that they kept it. That I agree that had they not, you know, stuck with the the technical side of things and and been limited and focusing on that, that it probably would not have been the same. Here's an interesting tidbit. It was an extravagance in 1957, 58, when they added David Bates to the team who styled the series two and, you know, gave it that barrel side uh, rather than the slab side. It it, it widened the vehicle a little bit. Not not where I needed it in the shoulders. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, no. (laughs) Unfortunately, no. But But, you know, and then David Bates, if I'm not mistaken, led the design team on the Range Rover project, the Velar project. So and he carried through he that DNA remained initial sketches of the Velar project were a little odd, but I think they boiled it down to all that they needed and nothing else. I think at the time you also have to consider the resources and the technology that Land Rover had, the Rover car company had, Land Rover car company had what they were also limited. That's part of this constraints that they had. Uh, They didn't have money to put into tooling and into new, some new technologies and manufacturing technologies is probably a better way to say that Uh, they were certainly innovating technologies, but they, you know, they were using coils early. They were down later. They were using airbags earlier than others uh, as an example, but I don't think they had necessarily the funds to put into the big tooling efforts to, uh, to, to build the Land Rover. So there's that, as a result, form follows function in the vehicles as they came out. So there's a, there's another constraint that they were working with. Well, you know, I also think, John, that the Range Rover was enormously ambitious in terms of being a V8. I mean, 1970, right? We're, so we're, the design pipeline for the Range Rover is, I think, roughly 1968 to, to 1970. We're on the verge of the gas crisis, which was unforeseen, of course, but affected the global auto industry. And, and also the, the tax schemes in Europe and Great Britain that made V8s enormously expensive. So essentially you're asking uh, the public to accept a dressed up utility vehicle <laughs> with a V8 that gets terrible gas mileage and is at the top of the tax rolls probably in the UK I mean, that's a huge risk. But at the same time, they know that the landed gentry in the UK, you know, the the hunting set has been buying series Land Rovers since 1948 and has been very happy with them, but is wanting wanting more. Right. They they don't want to to trundle down the A roads. They want to be able to get to the hunt quickly. I mean, that's how I that's really how I envisioned the discussion going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so. The V8 does make sense, but again, enormous risk because what sort of what sort of market share, what sort of annual production can we expect? And then couple that with the labor disputes, which, you know, it, it's interesting. Another one of my episodes focused on Donald Healy and, and his career. And when he partnered with Austin, I referred to the sort of the juxtaposition between the way that Healy did things in a series of small sheds and the way that Austin did things. And, you know, 
they were referred to the, the, their corporate headquarters was referred to as the Kremlin for good reason. I reference in the episode that labor reps and sh- shop foremen rose from the factory floor, like a great Yorkshire pudding. And that was really true in those days. I mean, the organized labor side was so heavy. And so they, they had a grip on every aspect of these companies. So my point being, it was a tremendous risk for Rover to, to venture forth with the, the Range Rover. And thank God they did. And as a little interesting point for those who may not be aware, it's, you know, Land Rover became, especially the Range Rover became a luxury SUV. It was at the time, at least I don't think it is luxury when I look back upon it now. It's, it, it may have been more luxurious than the Land Rover. <laughs> It was, you know, you're not talking uh, the, the plush, luxury, uh, very soft uh, and, and high quality materials that you have now in, in modern Range Rovers. I, just, some, just something to keep in mind, too, when we're talking about constraints on what they had to, had to work with. For sure. It's all relative. What, what was the alternative prior to the Range Rover? I mean, you could commission uh, a bespoke shooting brake. You know, you could yeah. you could buy a Rolls Royce and take it to Mulliner or another coach builder and build a shooting brake. And that would be your hunt vehicle or you, your, your estate car. But, but the Range Rover fulfilled so many different needs um, for the market segment. I'm almost convincing myself that it wasn't a risk now, <laughs> but, but, it, <laughs> but it really was, it really was. So fascinating history. And, and, you know, of course we're looking at it in 2020 hindsight. So it was a tenuous time for the automobile industry worldwide. The center steering prototype was tested and given the green light. And by the winter of 1948, Rover's engineering team was nailing down a clean sheet design. They retained the 80 inch wheelbase of the Jeep, but the steel chassis was fully boxed and welded and all of the running gear was purpose built. By the spring, a number of pre-production vehicles were ready and undergoing testing. And the new car was launched in late April at the Amsterdam Motor Show. Tell us about your your history, your Land Rover history. I know you you are a series owner. Yeah, so I'll tell you, it sounds almost too good to be true, but my imprinting with Land Rovers began with Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. And I mm-hmm. only realized that as an adult because, I mean, that's what it is. It's a subconscious thing, right? But I remember watching the program as a kid in the 70s and there were Land Rovers. I was already interested in cars as a, as a little kid. And even though I couldn't necessarily identify one from another at the time, later in life, I do remember, you know, that that's must be where it, it came from because, you know, you sort of look back, you sort of reflect and you wonder where, where do I get these interests? Fast forward to college and I'm driving a 1992 Ford F-150 pickup. Great pickup, by the way, but the salesman had totally hosed me. I mean, I was 19 years old. He saw me coming a mile away. I was paying ridiculous interest and I needed to get out from under that truck. I happened to pull into a parking lot one day and there was a probably about a 1964 109 station wagon in that parking lot. And it was pastel green, pretty faded and weathered and some bare aluminum showing. And I walked over to that thing and I forgot whatever it was that I was doing there because for the next probably 30 minutes, I just looked at that thing and circled it and, you know, noted the details. And I realized, wow, you know, I had forgotten about these and I just couldn't believe all of the amazing little bits and bobs on this vehicle. Right. And, and how simple it was. I started looking for a Land Rover and I went to Hemmings Motor News and I found one not that far away called the guy, made an appointment. He was dealing in old British cars. It didn't matter what, you know, this is the American Southwest. So he had rust free cars and most of his business was repatriating them to England and Europe where everything rusts. He had a little bit of everything, you know, TR3s, Frog Eye Sprites, Land Rovers, oddities, like maybe a Triumph Stag or something like that. And he had a a whole yard of them. In the corner was a 1964 Series 2A pickup. It was was pastel green. And there wasn't a straight panel on the entire truck. It was a diesel, but it ran. It was smoky, but it ran. And 
we drove it around his paddock and the first time I hit the brake pedal, it sunk to the floor and we got out and looked underneath it. And one of the lines had sheared off because it was, you know, they were rusted through. So it only took that one, that one time applying the brake and they were done. So anyway, I was sold. <laughs> can you believe it? Oh, yes, actually we can. We, we understand completely. I paid way too much for it. I'm too embarrassed to even tell you. And mind you, this is 25 years ago. So you can imagine, mm -hmm. took it home, stripped it down over the next two years and rebuilt it and owned that vehicle for like 25 plus years, sold it recently to a good friend who um, lives in Northern California. And he's since kind of made it his own. He's changed a few things and, and he's, he's, he's actually corrected some deferred maintenance that I, you know, I, I will admit to. Do you have visitation rights? I do have visitation rights. Good. Yes. Good. That's expressly, I have that in writing. But you don't regret it? I do, do I regret selling it? No, I don't regret selling it because I, I, you know, at first I wasn't open to selling it. He persuaded me, but, you know, I really also persuaded myself. I had done what I was going to do with that particular truck. And I'm on the hunt for a, an 80 inch series one. So, um, you know, you have to, you, you, ha you have to give to get right. And mm -hmm. the, the rule with my wife is if you want one, you need to sell one. <laughs> and, and that goes for whatever else I have motorcycles and other cars. So, um, cause I don't just have Land Rovers in the meantime, I have a 1960 series two 109 station wagon to dry my tears in. That's good. That's good. I've got that. And, and, you know, that 109, my kids have grown up in that. I, I bought that from a guy in Seattle who had gone through a divorce and, you know, the truck was a bad memory for him. So he wanted to be rid of it. But for me, it, it, it was our family wagon and our trail truck for the last 12 years. And my kids have grown up in it. And in fact, the great thing about it guys is, you know, on a road trip, maybe 300 miles to get where we need to go off road, my kids couldn't fight in the back because it was too loud for them to argue. So, <laughs> and that's just sitting with the engine running. That's not even underway. That's right. And I mean, add an overdrive and you drop by about what? Five decibels. So it's negligible, but, and, and you know, my wife and children tolerated 60 miles an hour for hours. But I will say this, it also gives you an opportunity to kind of see the country that you're passing through and notice things you, you wouldn't otherwise notice. And also you're focused on driving. You're focused on the road and what's going on around you. You're, there's no way you're on your cell phone. There's no way you're sending a text. You're reading the newspaper. You're eating lunch. Uh, <laughs> you just, <laughs> all those things I've seen non-Land Rover owners do. Uh, it just doesn't happen. You're, you're, you're focused on the function of driving. And Absolutely right. And generally you're taking the road less traveled as well. That's because you don't want that 18 wheeler to come up behind <laughs> you at 85 <laughs> miles an hour and around a bend <laughs> and go, Oh, look, there's a slow moving vehicle. Yeah. You know, in California, it really depends on where you are, but we're not blessed with the secondary roads that the rest of the U.S. has and um, up into Canada. So our secondary roads are often more dangerous than the interstates or the freeways. For example, you know, I have to climb out of the coastal area. Anytime I leave my house to go inland, I'm climbing. And if you do that on a secondary road, you're liable to get a mile of cars behind you. I mean, angry drivers. So yeah, it is a little bit of a challenge out here. In general, I do take the freeway when we go on long distance trips, but I, I tuck in behind a tractor trailer that's going 55, which is the speed limit for tractor trailers in, in California. And I draft a little bit. I save a, you know, a quarter gallon of gas and, and we're, we're happy that way. And, and I've, you know, many times I've climbed the grapevine here in Southern California. So for those who don't know, the grapevine is Interstate 5 leaving the Los Angeles Basin and going into the San Joaquin Valley or the Central Valley. And that'll drop you down and take you to Bakersfield and points north like Fresno and Sacramento. The reason they call it the grapevine and they have for many, many years is because there were grapevines uh, historically grown. There were, there were vineyards down on the uh, 
the northern side, the 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 San Joaquin Valley side, and and the the freeway crosses itself at one point. You're actually looking at like if you're going northbound, the southbound traffic is on your right, which is really kind of weird. But I digress. So so we cross the grapevine uh, behind a tractor trailer, and traffic is blowing by me at 80, 85 miles an hour, and I'm talking about full size crew cab pickup trucks with massive wheels and tires just blowing by. Meanwhile, at the steepest parts of the grade, I'm doing 25 behind a tractor trailer. I mean, you talk about seeing the country, we can count the rabbits, right? So that's, <laughs> that's the kind of road trip yes, that, yes. that we're accustomed to. Which kind of brings to light why Land Rover has finally come out with a modern Defender that can do the things we just talked about, which is safely transit American interstates without having to worry about an 18-wheeler coming up behind you around a blind bend at 85 miles an hour. Yeah, and you guys, what are your thoughts on the new Defender? I like it. Uh, I've not, I've, I test drove one. I think it's a, an amazing vehicle from what I've seen and heard. It has, you know, its problems being the first model years coming out and they've got issues they're, they're having to work with. But from everything that I have heard, it's, it is as capable as, as one would expect. I think it's a Land Rover. I know there's a lot of folks that say it's not a Land Rover. It's not a Defender. It's, you know, it's something else and they call it names. It's, I, I, it's a Land Rover. It's Defender. It was made by the Land Rover company. It comes from them. They made it. They built it. It's a Land Rover. And I think that the Defender falls where it would have fallen roughly had the Defender been upgraded more gradually over time, at least in my mind, you know, for a lot of us seeing that that huge jump uh, or leap in development it's more like ripping the band-aid off <laughs> I, I think it's more like cutting your arm off but yes <laughs> yeah it's uh it, it's a lot to take in uh, but i think that it's it's roughly about where we would have ended up regardless maurice uh, you don't probably don't know this i had actually visited the Land Rover factory before they announced the end of the Defender line uh, of, yeah, the Defender line. I went for the Land Rover experience and they said, Oh, do you want to take a tour of the, uh, of, of the factory? It's like, please, yes, let's do this. And I was up close. There was a small group of us, like four of us, and, and they were, they're walking us around and showing us the, the, the production line. There, are, there literally were guys and gals hand building the Defender. The only thing that was, that was not hand built was the drivetrain. They had, they had an automated system that put the engine with the transmission. Then that went into the old line that's been around for, I don't know, almost at that point would have been, what, 60 years, and still building Defenders by hand, one at a time, bulkhead goes in, doors go on. That was a light bulb moment for me when I saw that, how it was, how it was built. Yes, they were selling, but they weren't selling the U.S. Here in the U.S., around the world, really, let's say, you know, quality has gone up significantly. And Land Rover could not keep that quality of that vehicle as much as people wanted to. It was not going to happen. And they needed to progress. They needed to make that change. But that seeing it hand-built was, was a light bulb moment for me that the change was coming and it had to happen. There's just no way they could continue production. Yeah, the real surprise is that the Defender lasted as long as it did, right? I remember seeing concept drawings of the new Defender in somewhere around 2002. So it was a long time coming. I suspect that the, the shock of some Land Rover fans and loyalists was akin to when the Range Rover came out in 1970. I'm sure there were plenty of naysayers who said, this is not a Land Rover. And the same thing with the Discovery and the same thing with the Freelander. These all, all these, this has always happened. And, and I think I'll probably always will. <laughs> so, but also the, yeah. the market for Land Rovers was stale and stagnant and the people that wanted a defender had a defender and the people that wanted a, a you know a modern vehicle were buying those they were buying discoveries they were buying range rovers and those except here of course in the u.s when they could not buy a defender because they couldn't they were not allowed to buy a defender based on you know our our, our laws and emission and safety laws they couldn't buy one so that of course caused the the aftermarket to explode so people were then buying them. So that showed you there was a market for the Defender here in the U.S., but the rest of the world, the Defender really wasn't selling well. 
you know, they, they talk about how it's sold, you know, X amount of numbers. Well, most of that numbers was, was in the last century, really the last couple of years, they were not, they were, they could have been, have, they could have had three lines going, you know, three shifts going building defenders. But when I was visiting back in, I think it was 2015, they had one shift. That was it. And it was like three or four days a week. They were not running flat out building defenders. There wasn't that much demand. So a change had to come. A change had to come. Morgan said it was uh, it was a major shock to the system. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to me to think about what if Land Rover had invested the sort of marketing and PR in the, let's say, the legacy Defender 10 to 15 years ago, that they invested in saying farewell to it in 2015. I wonder how many more they would have sold. I mean, it, it seemed to me that they always, it was kind of a millstone around their neck. You know, they were only building it because, well, because there were, there were certain commercial customers that demanded it. It was the brand for so many years and it was sort of attracting people into showrooms, kind of a lost leader, if you will. And selling a lot of discoveries when people realized, eh, you know, the defender really, it doesn't have the the features that I'm going to need every day. It's a great capable vehicle, but it's a little bit crude. My point is we really only appreciated it when it was gone, but by and large, and that is true of Land Rover itself. I think they, they, they really didn't realize what they had until they, they quit building it. I don't know. It's just, I'm just riffing here. I could be completely wrong, but that's just my sense. And, and look at, look at the perceived scarcity of legacy defenders. Now, I mean, they are selling for mid six figures in some places. Oh yeah, it's insane. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I I do think you're wrong, Maurice, but you're not wrong at the same time. I I I will say I think Land Rover knew what they had and they knew about the legacy, but they really couldn't talk about that here in the U.S. because they didn't have the vehicles here. They couldn't bring the Defender name couldn't show up in the U.S. until, what, 2009, 2010? When was it? It was 1985, right? 84, when the Defender name kicked in was, no, 86. So you had 25 years to that. And so we're talking 2012. Yeah, right. Of course, because you know, my 87, I have an 87 110. I brought that in in 2012. It was, had just made its 25-year uh, limit. You know, they did try a number of things over the years, to your point of trying to play on those, uh, they had tried to set up a, a down in South Carolina, try to have set up a heritage center, but then the, the economy dropped and had, you know, the, and the, this was right before, I think also the pandemic. So we had economic issues and we had the pandemic. And I think they, so they dropped that idea because they had their own financial issues and they dropped that whole idea. But going back further, saying about play on their, the marketing of the Defender back in the day, you know, maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago, they were owned by BMW. And the only reason that BMW bought Land Rover was to st steal, quote unquote, steal, I'm saying the word steal, the Range Rover product line to create their X series, which is what they did. They got the, they got all the X series, they got the stuff they needed for X series and they sold it off to Ford. Ford had it brought it together with Jaguar and Aston Martin and Volvo. I think Ford was investing in, in Jaguar and helping them out. I think they would have turned to Land Rover next and then probably, and they, everyone knew the Defender needed to be modernized, uh, but the economy tanked in 08 and then Ford sells off everything uh, to, to get it from under that. So, and then it goes to Tata and Tata, you know, had the money and they're like, look, we got to do this. I, I think you're wrong, but I also think you're right. <laughs> you're not wrong uh, <laughs> because there, there were, I think they did acknowledge and knew that they had to make those changes. They came out with a DC 100 concept you mentioned, and it was panned and everybody hated it. But that goes to Morgan's point about, you know, ripping the bandaid off and making this big change. And, you know, that really affected, it sounds like from what we can understand now, it really affected the design folks at Land Rover to, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, or we got to, we really do have to get this right. They had, I think, challenges in executing that. I, you know, they stopped producing the old Defender in 2016 and it wasn't until 2020 when the, they waited, what, four years to bring out the new one. I think it was good to wait. I don't think coming out with it immediately like everyone thought they should have done. I don't, I think it was smart to wait uh, a number of years to let the, let the old defender kind of settle. John, I think we're both kind of saying the same thing from different points of view. Your, your point about the passing around of the brand to all these various companies, whether it's, you know, BMW or Ford's premier automotive group or, or Tata, that, that was, that hurt, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that's, 
I think that's part of what I'm saying. And um, it's all contributory, let's say. At the end of the day, the success of the new Defender kind of speaks for itself. I mean, I haven't seen sales figures, but I, I know what I see in Southern California and they're everywhere. And we'll give you, we'll give you a stat, Maurice, the new defender in its first, I think it's nine months or first half of this year, 2021 has sold more de- defenders. It's like 20,000 units or plus, if I remember correctly, they sold more of those than they did of the heritage Land Rover that was available in North America back in 90, what, four to 97 They've sold more in nine months than they did in, all, in that three years. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, I see them everywhere. I've driven both both wheelbases of the new Defender, and it's a fantastic vehicle. I do notice that the new owners are completely oblivious to any older Land Rover. Yes. I, w- I, wanna, I think I want to make that the mission of the podcast for the next 100 episodes is to let the new Defender owners know that there is a heritage out there and uh, they should at least be aware of it. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think this is a generational shift too. I mean, and that's really what they were going for, right? I mean, they were building this for a, a new customer, a mm-hmm. customer that wanted ruggedness and they wanted maybe some capability beyond um, a conventional SUV, like anything else, like a, a BMW X series or an Audi SUV and what have you. Or a dry cabin. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a new, it's a new breed of Land Rover owner. Absolutely. Oh, it very much is. Although there are people that, that are heritage owners, they listen to the podcast and there, and, and there's a number of them just to just, you know, paying attention to our audience that have bought the new Defender, like right off the bat, they want to try it out. So I, kudos to them. I don't know that they are, you know, necessarily the all the owners of the new one, but the, the there is a good chunk that are, especially in in North America, who went ahead and did, you know, they they are either current owners of a of a Heritage One Ten or wanted to be, and then said, no, no I'm going to buy the new one. And there seems to be a, a sizable number of those folks. But you are generally correct. I do agree with the fact that they they had to go to a new audience, a, a new buyer, and they are you know, definitely skewing younger. They want that more activity vehicle because that's where the world is. You know, the, we're not farming like the original series was partly built to do. You got to, you got to work for the, uh, the, the owner as, as it is in its time, just as your podcast talked about the development of the Land Rover was, came out of its time. Yeah. You know, and I do make that point in the episode, which is if you've got an old Land Rover, hang on to it because it will last. And that is the best part of your episode. If you've got one, hold on to it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I, of course I just told you 10 minutes ago that I, I sold uh, my 64. But again, I, I mean, there's two in the driveway and, and one in boxes and uh, a, a bare frame here um, w- awaiting restoration. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's remarkable how many have survived and and it was because they were so useful and easy to fix. I mean, uh, and, and in the developing world, l- let me give you guys, a, a, let me tell you a little story. I was in Tahiti in, I want to say 2003. And I was on the island of Morea, which is off, you know, the main island of Tahiti. And the minute I got off the ferry boat and we kind of went down the road, I began to see series Land Rovers. And I didn't stop seeing series Land Rovers for the next three days. Everywhere I went on Morea, I, I started looking very closely at them. And many of them were, they were held together with spit and bailing wire guys. I mean... It was amazing. One of them didn't have a seat box. It had a makeshift plywood box built in there and there were no cushions or anything. And the guy was driving it around with his chickens next to him in the cab. They were still working. They were still doing what Land Rovers do. And, and I remember we took a hike to the interior of the Island. We came down the hill and into a pineapple plantation. And then off to the left side of the road, there was a kind of a big building and it almost looked like a church to me. It wasn't a church, but it just had a high roof. Right. And in the distance next to the building, I saw some series Land Rovers lined up and we went ahead and walked down that driveway until we saw what it was, which was the Land Rover garage from Maria. Right. The guy had, I don't know, eight or 10 of them lined up in, in various states of repair. So 
We called that the Church of the Land Rovers from from that point forward. Oh, there you go. There were Land Rovers all over the island. And again, this was, you know, 2003, not really that long ago. And here are all these mid to late 1960s Land Rovers still doing work every day. I think that a lot has to do with modernity and your modern vehicles being much more complex than they were back in the 60s, 70s, and probably even the 80s. And now we're getting into very complex vehicles, electronics. I think Land Rovers will, the, the original series trucks will continue to be in those places where it's tough to repair a more modern vehicle. I think you'll continue to see this for a long time. No doubt about it. And everywhere I go in the world, I end up finding um, a series Land Rover earning its keep. In 1950, an Australian-born writer named Barbara Toy made a bet in a London pub that she would drive to the Middle East and back. Before long, she set out alone in a second-hand 80-inch Land Rover, christening the car Pollyanna. The little car took her from Gibraltar to Baghdad. Toy made at least seven long-range expeditions in Land Rovers over the next 40 years. Africa, Australia, Asia, North America, and mostly the deserts of the world. Maurice, it's been an honor to have you come on the podcast and talk about your podcast, Horsepower Heritage. I encourage folks, please listen to episode 007. Should be easy to remember which number. That was back in September of 2020. It's called Land Rover, the accidental icon. Even if you are not a Land Rover person, you'll get something out of it. Uh, if you are Land Rover adjacent, if your spouse is someone who is listens to this podcast and is a big Land Rover fan and you're like, what's going on? What's this all about? Maurice's podcast, I think, will give you a little sense of why we find them so special and why people really enjoy Land Rovers and, and everything that goes along with it. So please go out and check Horsepower Heritage, episode 007. Land, Land Rover, the XNO icon. I'll have links to all the places you can find Horsepower Heritage and Maurice in the show notes, of course, but I know he's on YouTube. He's on Twitter. He has his own website, which is horsepowerheritage.com. Maurice, thanks again for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was a real pleasure to be on. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for plugging the show. I'm on all the major podcast apps. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music. Yeah, a little bit of a different slice of automotive and motorcycle history every week. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. It is a weekly podcast. What, what else do you cover? I know it's a generally a, a motoring podcast. Are you mainly talking about the vehicles themselves or do you talk about other aspects of, of vehicles and motoring? Yeah, so, you know, the tagline for the show is the people and the stories behind the machines. So I think a lot of, automotive podcasts get wrapped up in the technicals, right? And it's a little bit dry. And if you don't know the technicals of whatever car they happen to be talking about, then it you quickly lose interest. So my thing is, all of this stuff came from human creativity and hard work. And so I try to find interesting guests who can tell me that history and and what, what their efforts amounted to, you know, the show is, is there's really two kinds of episodes that I do. So I do interviews, but I also do storytelling episodes and the storytelling episodes are just my take. And that happens to be the case with episode 007 Land Rover, the accidental icon, you know, it's my love letter to Land Rover. And I, I, I hope that, uh, you know, I made this point earlier that you have to strike a balance. And the other challenge with the episode was to not make it too much of a love letter to Land Rover, because you, you have to be objective at the same time, having a loyalist view, you have to be objective. So I hope that came through in the episode. And, and, and like you say, I mean, I think whether you're a, a Land Rover owner or you're fairly uninitiated, I think you're going to come away appreciating the brand more so. Absolutely. And I encourage folks to listen to that episode, as I've said now, I think six times. And that's how much I thought it was uh, the thought you had done such a great job. Again, Maurice, thanks very much for coming on the podcast. We appreciate you joining us for our 100th episode of the Center Steer Podcast. 
It's my pleasure, guys. Thanks a lot. And congratulations, by the way. 100 episodes is a huge milestone. A little inside baseball. There's, there's a phenomenon called pod fade, which you may be familiar with. But of the 2 million podcasts currently available on the internet, the vast majority have not published an episode in the last 90 days. Most of them are, they're just dead bodies floating in a sea of, of podcasts. <laughs> yeah. And so you definitely deserve congratulations for making it to a hundred. Um, I'm at episode 30 this week. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a little bit of a hamster wheel. It's a, a weekly is a challenge, but be that as it may, you guys have done a tremendous thing getting to a hundred. So I wish you uh, success and here's to 200. Maybe 110, maybe 130. Well, those are going to be special episodes, of course, are they not? Uh, yes, yes. We, we will do our best to make uh, to make those special episodes. Fantastic. We hope you enjoyed show number one hundred. Do 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 one hundred. Thanks to thanks to Harold, thanks to Morgan, and thanks to Dixon for for helping out with the today show, and also for the past one hundred episodes in all the ways that you've helped, known and unknown. I uh, want to personally thank you for that, and thanks for coming on today. Uh, joining us for number 100. And also thanks to Maurice Merrick and to Bill Burke for joining us for the 100th in uh, this special edition of the podcast. Of course, you probably haven't heard Bill Burke yet because this is the end of the main show and our conversation with Bill Burke will be a separate file posted very shortly if it hasn't already been done. And if you don't already know who Bill Burke is, you definitely need to listen to this because you've been under a rock for way too long. And Thanks to the One True Packs for his continued production support, helping us to sound good. Thank you, Packs. We really do appreciate it. If you see Packs while you're in and around in and around New York, wave to him. I think he's still in a disco. Thank you for making us uh, sound not quite so bad. And also, before I ask you to stick around from the beginning of the podcast, to, to uh, I have a special invitation to all of our listeners. You have two years to prepare. In 2023, it will be the 75th anniversary of Land Rover. I'm inviting everyone, Land Rover owners who have a series or a Defender in particular, to come to the Vintage Grand Prix in July in Pittsburgh. That's the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in 2023. We're going to try to make this a thing. As in, uh, what that means is that we're going to try to partner with the Vintage Grand Prix, maybe get Land Rover North America involved. But even if they don't, the podcast is inviting you to come to the Vintage Grand Prix in 2023, and we're going to show off all the the, the Land Rovers that are that are, are functional in North America. We want to have a large display of that. All functional Land Rovers in North America to be in Pittsburgh <laughs> on that day, because we are going to party like it's 2023. <laughs> so Dixon. Okay. You have two years to get across the border, to get your truck ready and get it transported to Pittsburgh for this event. I'm specifically calling you out uh, because I want to see you at the Vintage Grand Prix driving your series truck. Well, uh, giving the border is more probably a problem of getting physically across the border because my Land Rover at the rate we're going is still going to be sitting in New Jersey. So all I have to be able to do is sneak across and then drive west. Well, the problem then is it will have sat for so long, you're going to have to go through everything once again. Oh, I realize that too. But Vintage Grand Prix probably isn't too far away from um, the Roadster Factory summer party. I've been there, so uh, it should be able to be found. Are they still holding it? I Probably not. I have it, no idea. Yeah, well, I know Charles has died. I'm not sure if they kept the, the tradition up or not, but yeah, they're just up the road. They're about less than an hour from here. So fellow Land Rover owners, especially Series and Defender owners, I ask you to begin preparations. You see, you have two years now, actually 23 months, because you should be ready by June. We want you to be ready by June of 2023 to transport your vehicle to Pittsburgh or the, towards the end, it's usually around July 23, July 24th is when the, the British Car Day happens. Uh, hopefully it'll be a weekend event where a number of things will go on. We'll get that sorted out in the next two years, hopefully here. But you have to uh, so you begin now. If you're thinking, oh, I've always wanted to get my series truck back on the road, Morgan. <clears throat> now you have a reason to do that. And you now have two years to get it ready. Two years I, is enough time to get it running or to buy the one you've always wanted. If you don't have the one you want, you have time to get it and then get it here. Well, actually, John just said transport it. So he's being open and inclusive. And he's just said that you can go and trailer your, your 
you're a freelander to the event too. The the problem with that is that the 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 car show at the Grand Prix you have to enter the grounds on your own power. You can't drag a trailer up onto the golf course. So you could get it really really close, but oh. it'd have to be running enough to make it up the one hill. A very fine tow rope for, to another vehicle, <laughs> invisible. Gossamer thread. Well, maybe, maybe if we did a very very close convoy to where you, there was just inches between each one and had a whole parade of them like a like a parade of elephants, maybe they wouldn't notice. Or maybe make it look like uh, a famous rally that they had in Nova Scotia, but have the Freelander look like it's towing a series vehicle or something when the, the series vehicle is actually pushing the Freelander onto the, the ground. Dixon, Dixon, it, it needs to be under its own power. Let, let's just make it easy. <laughs> Get whatever, whether it's a Freelander, well, whether it's a series truck, whether it's a, a four control, whether it's a Range Rover, Range Rover Classic, a Discovery, Disco one, two, three, four, five, or even a six by then when they have it, we'd like it to be there. And, and so you now have time, especially, and especially I'm calling out series owners to get that truck back up and ready. If there's a reason that you ever needed to get the truck back on the road, you're like, I know it's been sitting there. I've got the parts. I've sorted them out. I've been looking for this part. I've been looking for that part. I've been worried about, I don't have the time. Now you have a reason. This is a reason you need a reason to do it. 2023, July, you're going to be in Pittsburgh for the vintage grand prix in celebration of Land Rover's 75th anniversary. The referee has issued the two year warning. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening for the last 100 episodes. We'd love to hear from you and what you've been up to in your Land Rover. Click on voicemail on the website and let us know. The next voicemail will receive a center steer t-shirt. That's one of the moon versions. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. And you may now resume 100 more important things. Ah, Bill Burke, I know you. <laughs> no, no, that's enough of that. We call that the Church of the Land Rovers from, from that point forward. That's a very good observation. Well, we don't have a campfire and I don't have any bourbon, so uh, I'm, not going, I'm not going much longer. Do-do-do-do, 100. <laughs>